Good Tuesday morning and welcome to our uh, Facebook Live Bible class on how to study the Bible as we're continuing this series. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo to those of you who might have uh, some heritage with uh, that holiday. Um, we've been considering and continuing this study now for quite some time. And uh, just by way of review, as people are still logging in to the class, uh, by way of review of the major points, and remember the major points come from an outline that I borrowed from Brother Franklin Camp that I heard many years ago. Point number one, as studying the Bible, getting kind of a general overview of where everything fits together. Point number one is the period of perfection from Genesis chapters one and two. And then point number two is the problem of sin from Genesis chapter three, verses one through 13. Then we have the purpose of God, Genesis chapter three, verses 13, uh, 14 and 15. Then we have the promise of redemption, Genesis chapter 12, verses one through four. Then we have pictures of redemption from Genesis, to all, from Genesis 12 all the way through the book of Esther, the books of history as we're normally calling them, the law and the history. And then we have poems of redemption, and that's from, from Job through the Song of Solomon. Then we have the prophecies of redemption. Remember, we spent two lessons on that particular point because some of the prophecies have reference to the personal Messiah. Others of the prophecies have reference to the Messianic uh, age or the church age. And then last time we were looking at the pause of redemption because during that 400 and plus years between Malachi and Matthew, uh, there is no prophecy and the things kind of came to a standstill as far as revelation was concerned. And yet in world events, we saw that there were quite a few upheavals, a lot of changes politically, culturally, socially, and the Jews who had been taken into Babylonian captivity were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild their temple and to restore the order of their law and also even to rebuild the wall of the city and to, to live there once again. And so we saw a lot of changes, though, from the Persian Empire when we closed the Old Testament to the Roman Empire when we opened the New Testament. And in between those, of course, was the Greek empire established by Alexander the Great. So a lot of things took place in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between Malachi and Matthew during those 400 years. Silent as far as the Bible is concerned, but certainly not silent in secular history. So today we come to our ninth point in our a series on how to study the Bible. And today's point is the preparation for redemption. And this covers the books of Matthew through uh, the first chapter of Acts, all four gospels and the first chapter of Acts, because now everything is set. As we said, when we began looking at that last point, the pause of redemption, remember that everything that took place between the Old and the New Testaments from Malachi to Matthew, help to contribute to the fullness of time that Paul refers to in Galatians chapter four and verse four. And that's why now, as we open the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the time is right. And now the time has come for the process of redemption to be uh, put into place. And that's what we're reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, some people often wonder, why do we have four different gospels? Well, one answer to that is we don't. There's only one gospel. We have four different accounts of the one gospel of Jesus Christ. They should not be looked at as if they were in competition with each other. They certainly shouldn't be looked at as if they are presenting different uh, viewpoints or different accounts of Jesus. But what we have are four different perspectives of the life of Jesus Christ. Someone has suggested that the Gospel of Matthew was addressed mainly to those from a Jewish background. And when you look at the Gospel of Matthew very carefully, I think that we can see where that's very likely because it begins the very first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
And then we have those first 16 verses regarding the genealogy of Jesus going all the way back to Abraham. And then we find many times throughout the gospel of Matthew, more times than in the others, where Matthew is very concerned about showing the fulfillment of prophecy. This was done that it might be fulfilled. And you'll find that many times in the gospel of Matthew. The other gospel accounts also include that but Matthew seems to emphasize that fact. It seems as if he's writing to convince those from a Jewish background, the Messiah you've been expecting, the savior you've been looking for, the deliverer that has been promised has been given in Jesus Christ. Then we look to the gospel of Mark and Mark begins very quickly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he begins with John, the forerunner, presenting a fact that the time is fulfilled. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. The time is at hand, the time is fulfilled. Well, what time is that? The time looked forward to by all those prophecies, the time that Paul refers to as the fullness of time. The time is here. And Mark apparently uh, was writing, he, he writes in such a style, as a matter of fact, I read the gospel of Mark just this morning, but he writes in such a style that everything is in a hurry. He uses the word straightway in the King James Version or immediately uh, so many times in, in his gospel account, in his record, Jesus is going from here to there, to yonder, to another place, to another place. He's constantly busy. People are constantly coming up and asking him. People are constantly bringing people to him to be healed. And some have thought that Jesus or that Mark is writing for the Roman because Romans were, were very much uh, people who uh, admired those men of great strength and great leadership and great ability and men who were uh, accomplishing great things. And that's what Mark presents for us. And then we come to the Gospel of Luke, and the first two chapters of Luke really uh, are uh, setting the stage. They're reaching back to the Old Testament. Uh, Luke, first of all, announces the birth, the coming birth of John the baptizer, and then he announces to Mary the birth of her son. And then we read of the birth of both of those. And then in chapter three, we find that uh, John comes preaching again, repent for the kingdom of God is near or is at hand. So we find that Luke apparently was writing perhaps to a Greek audience. Uh, he himself being the only Gentile among the writers of the New Testament would have had a very great interest in those from that background. And the way that he writes it, uh, his emphasis on foreigners who are coming to Jesus, his emphasis on uh, the, the place of women and the, uh, role, their roles and their following of Jesus and different things seem to indicate that that may have been Luke's focus. But then we have the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John seems to have been written for every man. It is every man's gospel. It is the universal gospel. And it begins by taking us all the way back to Genesis because the very first verse of John chapter 1, in the beginning, well, that reminds us, of course, the very first verse of the Bible back in Genesis chapter one and verse one. In the beginning was uh, God created the heavens and the earth. John says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God, etc. So each one of the gospel accounts has a little different approach, gives us a bit different perspective. But they're all presenting the same Jesus and they are all presenting for us the same preparation and means of redemption. And that's what we're going to be emphasizing within the next few moments. Because as we look through these gospel accounts, we're going to see, first of all, Jesus teaching. If you want to look at Matthew chapters five through seven, near the very beginning of Matthew's account, we find the great Sermon on the Mount. And there we find where Jesus is setting forth principles that are going to be uh, for those who are going to be in his kingdom. Uh, kingdom principles, you might say, foundational facts for those who are wanting to be in the kingdom. And those beautiful words, as a matter of fact, you'll find five different places in the Gospel of Matthew where there are fairly, fairly long discourses on the part of Jesus to his audiences, Matthew chapters five through seven being the first of those five. But then 
We also find that when Jesus was teaching, he oftentimes used parables. As a matter of fact, the parables of Jesus, many people love studying the parables, and there have been many really good uh, study guides and helps written concerning the parables of Jesus. Uh, much of his teaching was done that way, where our, our normal way of describing a parable or defining a parable is it's an earthly story, but it has a heavenly meaning. Well, what Jesus does, he takes things, common, ordinary, everyday things that people were familiar with. Now, since we are indeed quite a ways removed from in not only time, but also culture in which Jesus lived, the parables need a bit more explanation and interpretation for us. The people, though, who originally heard them when Jesus would talk, for example, about the road going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, they were very familiar with that road. They would have known exactly what he meant. Uh, when he was talking about wine uh, vineyards and about uh, towers and such as that, they would have known immediately what he meant. When he's talking about wedding feasts, well, we have some idea of what weddings are like, but their customs were quite a bit different. We need a little bit more background for that. But all of Jesus' parables and his teaching, he's reaching out to people. He's trying to describe for them the kingdom of God in terms that they can understand and he's challenging a lot of their preconceived notions. He challenges a lot of our preconceptions. When we read the Gospels very carefully, we're going to find that Jesus, though he was indeed humble and meek and gentle, there was another side to Jesus as well. There was this fiery Jesus. There was the Jesus who said, repent or perish. There was the Jesus who spoke more often of hell than anybody else in the New Testament. We need to understand that regarding Jesus and his teaching. And of course, as Jesus was going around teaching, he was also performing his signs, wonders, and miracles, as Peter refers to them in the second chapter of Acts. He's doing all these miracles, and what are they doing? They are showing us that Jesus is indeed, as we've seen in our studies on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights from the Gospel of John, remember what Nicodemus says in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. How? Because no one can do the things that you're doing, these signs that you're doing, unless God is with him. The miracles, the wonders, the signs that Jesus was doing in the midst of the people out in public where everybody could see them. He was not doing these things in a corner. He was not doing these things behind the scenes. Nothing was hidden. He was always out in the public. People were coming to him. They were bringing all manner of sick folks to him. Sometimes they'd have to carry them to him on beds. All these things that Jesus do it, was doing, a matter of public record. And it was showing the people to convince them that he did come from God, that he is the one sent from God, that he is the one that they have been expecting and anticipating. He is the one that they were hoping and longing for. He is indeed the Christ, the Savior. All of those things that Jesus said and all those things that Jesus did. But then, of course, we also read in the Gospels how that Jesus was persecuted, and another translation of the word for persecute would be hounded. Uh, he literally was hounded by the Jewish leaders. The political and religious leaders of the Jewish nation did not like what Jesus was saying and did not like what he was doing. Now, the Gospels are also very clear that the common people were hearing him gladly, the ordinary people, but, but the leadership they did not like Jesus because, again, his challenging their authority and his challenging the way that they were doing things. He challenged their greed. He challenged their hypocrisy. And he does the same things for us today. When we read the gospel accounts very carefully, we find that he is still challenging the greed and covetousness. He's still challenging the hypocrisy that is often practiced in the name of religion. You see, we need to take those same uh, lessons very uh, seriously that Jesus was teaching them. But they hounded him. They persecuted him. Finally, because one of his own disciples, one of the apostles, one of the 12, decided to betray him, they were able to arrest him. 
And having arrested him, we find then they put him on trial. First of all, they took him to the high priest, well, the father-in-law of the high priest, who was Annas. Then they took him to the high priest, Caiaphas. Then they had a, a trial before the entire Sanhedrin. And all of this was done in secret. All of this was done at night. All of this was done even in violation of their own code of ethical law. Yet they put Jesus on this trial. And even after they had false testimony against him that didn't agree with each other, they finally put Jesus, they put him under oath to testify against himself, which again was against their own law. But Jesus didn't, didn't hesitate this time in confessing that, yes, you say that I am the son of God, you say it correctly. And henceforth, you will see the son of man coming, sitting on the right hand of God and coming with the clouds, with power and great glory. And they, the high priest tore his robes at that, which again was illegal. Uh, he was not, he was supposed to be impartial. He was supposed to be the, the sitting judge, so to speak, and wasn't so supposed to show partiality either for or against the person on trial. But of course, by doing that, he expressed his uh, displeasure and he expressed his uh, condemnation of the prisoner, Jesus, on that occasion. Well, then they take him to Pilate. And Pilate, the Roman governor, in order for them to put him, be able to put him to death, he has to authorize it because this is the Passover. They're not going to do something like they would later do in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen and just drag him out of the city and stone him because of the Passover and because of so many people and because the Romans were uh, really watching things very carefully so there wouldn't be any rioting among the people. They try to go through things at least with the semblance of legality. And so they take him to Pilate and they pressure Pilate. Pilate examines Jesus. He questions him. Jesus doesn't have a lot to say, but he comes out to them and says, I find no cause of death in this man. I find no fault at all in this man. He tried to release to them another prisoner because that was the custom at the Passover. The Roman governor would release a prisoner to them that they desired. And he wanted to release Jesus. He even asked them, shall I release to you uh, Jesus who is called uh, the Christ? They said, no, we want Barabbas. Well, what then shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him, they said. And when he finally saw that he wasn't going to be able to prevail, and he saw that there was indeed about to be a riot, he finally washed his hands of the case, literally, and he delivered Jesus over to them. And he was taken out, first of all, beaten and scourged. Then he was crucified. It all looks, you know, at least to that point, it all looks as if, what's going on here? How is it that this could be part of the plan of God? How is it that this has anything to do with our redemption? And yet we're going to find that that is exactly where our redemption comes. It's through that blood that Jesus shed at that cross. It's through the blood that spilled from his, his veins and from his arteries. It's from that blood that was shed there. And it wasn't an accident. It was on purpose. It was all according to the purpose and plan of God. The promise that God made clear back in Genesis chapter 12 is now coming to its fruition here in these latter chapters of the four gospel accounts of the crucifixion of Jesus. And as we've said before, if we were speaking of any other person, if we were reading any other biography, we would probably have another chapter talking about his legacy. But in the case of Jesus, it's different. Because in the case of Jesus, his legacy, yes, indeed continues. But the fact is that the story doesn't end with his being put to death because he was raised from the dead. And this, according to the apostles, was the stamp of approval, you might say. The validation of all that Jesus had accomplished. God put his stamp of approval on him by raising him from the dead. And his apostles were the witnesses of that. They were the eyewitnesses. As you read in the last chapters of all four of the gospel accounts and even into the first chapter of Matthew, not only did they see him after he rose from the dead, but they also saw him, according to Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1, they saw him ascend back into heaven to go back to be with his heavenly father. And so our redemption is set. 
from the promise of redemption in Genesis chapter 12, all the way through Acts chapter one, the promise of redemption, the pictures of redemption, the poems of redemption, the prophecies of redemption, the pause of redemption, and now the preparation for redemption is made. Lord willing, Friday morning at 1030, as we continue this study, we'll come to point number 10 of our 12 point outline. And I'll go ahead and tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be the proclamation of redemption. And we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. Lord willing, we'll see you again at 1030 on Friday morning. Thank you for being with us this morning. And until, fr until Friday, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.